All right, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans. This is exciting as we are starting the book of Romans this morning. The book of Romans is a powerful book. And as we start our journey this, this morning through this amazing book, it seems weird to say it, but it is one of the most amazing books in the Bible. Now, they're all amazing. They're all wonderful. But the book of Romans has something special in everyone's heart. When you've gone through it, when you've read through it, you'll know it just touches you and empowers you in ways that you can't even imagine. The book of Romans is a book that opens up the gateway to heaven and gives us a closer glimpse of who God is. If you want to grow closer to the Lord, read the book of Romans. And I challenge you, as we go through this, as we're going to be in the book of Romans for about eight years. <laughs> I said four last week, but it might be a little longer. Um, as we go through the book of Romans, I encourage you to read ahead. Read through it. Dig into the book of Romans and you'll be excited. It has changed so many people's lives throughout the centuries. It's exciting to think what it can do for us. And I encourage you, as we start this new year, as we go through the book of Romans, you're not going to want to miss. You're going to want to make it a priority to be here on Sunday, and if you can't make it because you're out of town, you're deathly ill, or whatever it might be, you can catch up online because we have the videos or the, uh, the audio on there, and hopefully in the future the video is on there, and you can catch up and keep, keep up with us if you're away or out of town. But I encourage you, because this is a book that's just full of so much, as we're going to see this morning, you just want to soak it in. In the early days of the church, John Christostrum, so named because Christostrum means golden throat, because he was such an excellent orator. Can you imagine that? Having a nickname? Like, I'm John, I'm the golden throat preacher. Why is that? Because I'm so amazing. Now, I'm sure he didn't say that, but everybody else did. So much to the point that people used to erupt in the middle of his sermons with a round of applause. He'd be like, oh. He got so frustrated with it that he actually had a sermon that he wrote to tell people how it's not a good thing to interrupt the service with a round of applause. And you know what people did? They clapped more. <laughs> now, John uh, Christostrum, he uh, became one of the archbishops, but he was actually forced into the position. It's quite actually interesting. He was forced into the position because he's such an amazing teacher, but then he was exiled and kicked out. Exiled to his death because he taught very firmly on sin. It's like, we want you because you're a great teacher. Well, wait, we don't want you because you're too serious about sin. So get out of here. It's kind of amazing. Uh, uh, imagine his life. But John Christos was one who said that the book of Romans was the book that changed his life. And it, and, it said, and it said in history that he read the book of Romans and went through it every week. He read through the book once a week for 18 years. He continued to go through it and go through it and go through it. You can imagine that you'd have it completely memorized because it impacted him so much. As we go on through history in the summer of uh, 386, you guys remember that? <coughs> I do because I'm so old. A young man wept in the backyard of a friend's. He knew his life of sin and rebellion against God left him empty and feeling dead. But he just couldn't find the strength to make a final, real decision for Jesus Christ. As he sat there, he heard some children playing in another yard, and they, and they were calling out these words, take up, the, take up and read, take up and read. A common kid's song of the time. Thinking God had a message to him in those words, he picked up the scroll that was close by, and he read not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and lysis, uh, lys bad stuff, lysis, I can't Lysis. do the word. Yes. <laughs> not in quarreling and jealousy, 
but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Romans 13, 13 to 14. He didn't read any further. He didn't have to. At that moment, Augustine gave his heart to the Lord. And he became St. Augustine that we know so well. St. Augustine had such a powerful impact upon the church that even today we read his writings. Even today we're marveled. And even today people have a problem with him. Same with John Christostrum, because he's too harsh on sin and other issues. Well, we, we, we don't like the way that he really says we shouldn't sin. Well, you know what? That's what the word says, and so he taught it. It changed his life forever. Now, any of you guys know Augustine's life, as I already said, he was a bad kid. He got around. He had a horrible life, and God changed him powerfully and made him into a mighty man who did amazing things. And it was the book of Romans, again, that grabbed his heart. In August of 1513, a monk lectured on the book of Psalms to seminary students, but his inner life was nothing but turmoil. In his studies, he came across Psalms 31.1, In thy righteousness deliver me. The passage confused Luther. How could God's righteousness do anything but condemn you to hell? It could not. It could not deliver you. Luther kept thinking about Romans 1, verse 17, which says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The monk went on to write, Night and day I pondered until I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy he justifies us by faith. Therefore I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. This passage of, Paul's, of Paul became to me a gateway into heaven. Martin Luther was born again and the Reformation began in his heart as people's lives were changed. We go further on in history. John Wesley left England and sailed across the sea to America to be a missionary to the Indians. After failing miserably, he went back to England, saying, I went to save the Indians, but who shall save me? Wesley stumbled into a little church on Abington Street, where he listened to the minister read from Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. My heart was strangely warmed. He would later write, and John Wesley was saved as he understood at last that the price for sin was paid and that the work of salvation was complete. That it was done. I don't have to work. I don't have to do it myself. He had gone out as a missionary thinking, I got to do the work. And God stopped him in his tracks and said, no, the work's already done. Live in that freedom. And more recently, Chuck Smith while pastoring a non-denominational church, he went through the book of Romans and found that he could throw off the shackles of religion. For 17 years, he slaved away trying to figure out why things weren't working, why things weren't happening, why he wasn't feeling in his heart. He went through the book of Romans and he woke up and he said, because the work's already done. It's already been done. His life was changed and he left the denomination and went to pastor a small 25 little church called Calvary Chapel. It's a funny story. I've got some videos and stuff where they talk about it. And it's interesting because when he went and told his wife, they had a nice church plant going. It had a couple hundred people. It was doing really well. Just bought a new house. And he said, I want to move down the road and start pastoring this little church of 25. And she went, What? <laughs> what are you nuts? He's like, yeah, I feel like God's calling me there. He's like, we just finally got settled. Everything's going well. And the Lord called him, and the Lord did amazing things through the ministry of that little church in California. The book of, Mor uh, the book of Romans is going to change, challenge you this morning. It's going to move in your hearts. It's going to refresh you and teach you. I hope as you dive into these pages that your heart will be changed and move closer to God.
That's my desire, that this morning your heart's going to be changed as we dive in. So, let's dive in. Everybody there? Romans chapter 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now, we just finished going through the book of Acts, so we learned a lot about Paul. We learned a lot about who he was. A man raised in a strict Jewish family, sent off when he was young to train under the rabbi Gamaliel. Paul called himself a Pharisee of the Pharisee. One who held to the strictest line and letter of the law. The cream of the crop when it came to those who followed the law of God. So zealous that he dedicated his life to wiping out this new Christian sect, these group of believers in Jesus Christ. And he began hunting them down and putting them in prison and killing some until God got a hold of him when Jesus stopped him dead in his tracks on that road to Damascus and Paul's life was changed forever. Even his name was changed. His name was changed from Saul to Paul. The name Saul means requested one. It's the one who is requested. Now, you remember the Old Testament when they got Saul as their king? The nation of Israel said, we want a king. And God says, fine, you can have Saul, the requested one. You asked for him, you got it. Was he a good king? No. Didn't go so well. He went from Saul to Paul. And Paul means little. He went from requested one to little one. And you know, that's exactly what happens when we've had an encounter with Jesus Christ. We go from requested one, I got it all together, I've got it all figured out, to little one. Hey, I'm little, I'm small in the light of Jesus Christ. We're awakened to the truth that we need him. The Lord used Paul to sit down and write this book to the church in Rome. Paul used him to write this book. And it is believed that Paul wrote this book when he was in Corinth on his third missionary journey. And if you remember back as we went through the book of Acts, on his third missionary journey as he was heading back, what kept happening to him as he was heading back home? Quiz question. People kept bringing words to him, saying, Don't go to Jerusalem. Trials and tribulations await you. So Paul here, he's in Corinth, he's on his way back to Jerusalem, he spends about three months here, and he has a little bit of downtime, and the Lord inspires him to write this book to Rome because he says, I want to go to Rome. I have a desire to go to Rome. His plans was to go to Jerusalem, say hi to all the people there, drop off the gift that he'd collected to the, for the church, then head back to Antioch like he always did, hang out with his group there, his church there, and then head off to Rome. That was his plan. Hey, it's simple. I've already done a couple missionary journeys. This is how it works. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to head on my way. It's great. Then people start saying, hey, no, you're not. And he's like, okay. What? So he sits down, and the Lord puts it on his heart. Write a letter to Rome. Write a letter to these guys. And you can imagine in Paul's mind, he's thinking, well, you know what? Just in case I don't get there. Just in case something happens. I'm going to write a letter to the church in Rome. And because he had never been there, because he didn't establish the church there, because he only knew a handful of people that he had met traveling back and forth that were from Rome, the book of Romans is a completely different epistle than any of the other epistles he wrote. All the other epistles were written directly to a church and to a people and speaking to a problem or question that they had. You look at Corinth. He was in Corinth because he had already sent a letter to Corinth because they were a little messed up. He had sent a letter of correction to them. He sent a letter to the Thessalonians to answer their questions. He says, hey guys, I've got to answer your question. I've been gone, I heard some stuff coming back, I've got to answer your question. But the book of Romans, he has no question. He doesn't know what's going on there. And so he simply laid out doctrine and truth for them to bless them and encourage them. So this is what makes Romans so different. Romans was written to teach and to build up the church in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and his great plan of redemption. It was to lay everything down just in case he didn't get a chance to go. And so he wrote this book. Paul, 
Verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. A bondservant. Now, do we know what a bondservant is? Slave. A slave? Seven years, isn't it? Huh? Seven years. A bondservant is beyond the seven years. Now, in the Jewish tradition and law, you were a slave for six years, and on the sixth, end of the sixth year, you would be released from your duties as a slave. If you wanted to stay with your master, because your master was just a great guy, he took care of you. Now, we have to understand, when we talk about slaves, slavery was a little different back then. Let's just imagine, well, you work at Safeway, right? You're a slave to Safeway. <laughs> <laughs> it was like your employment. Now, some people were sold into it. A lot of people did it because of debt. Why do most of us work? Because we have debt. Because we have stuff to pay off. We have need money, so we have to work. And that's kind of the way the system worked back then. And so a lot of these people were just working off debt, working on things that they owed, or maybe their family couldn't afford it, so they would sell someone into slavery for six years. And so they would be working off. But as you're working for this person, like we saw in, in Joseph's life, Joseph was treated really good by Potiphar, except for his wife. Right? But he was what? He was in charge of his entire household. He was like a butler. So we have to think more of like a butler or a maid or a nanny who spends their entire life with them. But in the Jewish tradition, you spend seven years. You would grow up with these people, and at the end of the seven years, you could say, you know what? You are an awesome master. If I leave you, I've got to go start, on, start from scratch and start anew and, 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 and find a place, some, find some land and find some stuff and start all over. If I stay with you, I can just continue working for you. For the rest of my life, you feed me, you clothe me, you take care of me, you take me on family vacations. Oftentimes, slaves were treated like family, even to the point that if the family didn't have a next heir, they would adopt the slave that was with them the longest, who was the closest, and that person would become the heir to the family, become part of the family. And so you could say, you know, I, you know, I, um, I, I like you guys so much, I want to be part of the family, I want to stay. And so then you would become a bond servant. And you basically dedicate yourself to them for life. Now, does anybody want to help me with an illustration? I don't want to <laughs> Ryan. <yeah. laughs> now, you don't have to worry. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. How did they identify a bond servant? You went to Bible college. How did they do it? He, he needs his ears pierced. <laughs> well, they take it all like this. Don't worry. I cleaned it. <laughs> and they would take their ear and they'd take him down to the court or the uh, door, uh, the gate of the city where all the judges and leaders of the city would hang out. And before them all, he would take the awl, place it against the doorpost, and jam it through. You don't have to worry, Ryan. We should be okay here. I did bring our first aid kit. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've never actually opened it, but I'm sure it's got all the stuff in it. And your mom's a nurse. Oh, she's not here this morning. Well, Kathy, I'm sure she could probably remember how to clean up a horrible <laughs> Okay, uh, never mind. I tried to get Levi to do it. I said, come on, earrings are cool, and he wouldn't go for it. They would punch, they would take an awl or a nail. You can kind of imagine when I got a nail around here somewhere. And they would punch a hole in the person's ear and put a gold ring in it. And they would put that ring to signify, this isn't just a slave, this is a bond servant. He has dedicated his life to his master. So that's what Paul is saying. He's Paul, a bond servant, a bond slave. I've dedicated my life to you. I put my life away. And everything is now about you. It's about you. And I place you at the, the forefront of my life. If you want to see the law in Exodus chapter 21, verse 5, you want to jot that down. It says, if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl and he shall serve him forever. So you would dedicate your life completely to the master. You would pierce your ear and you would become a bond servant. The other thing that's amazing about a bond servant is that they, as they um, served their master, when people saw that they had that ring in their ear, they would respect them and honor them because they were an honorable person. They actually said, I give my life to this man or this family. I give my life to them. So people would honor them 
If they were downtown getting supplies, they'd be like, oh, a bond servant, wow, hey, you're a good guy. It's, it's, yeah. We still use it to this day. We say somebody is bonded. It's bonded, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Still use except it. we don't do the ring. Yeah. It would be kind of cool. Funny how we change that. <laughs> <laughs> so here it says that Paul himself, he's a bond servant. He's given his life completely over to his master, Jesus Christ. No debt, no obligation, only free service out of his love for his master, Jesus Christ. It's a wise choice to give yourself to the Lord completely. It's a very wise choice because he is a good master and he treats us well. You might be thinking, I'm a little busy. I'm really a little busy to be a full-time servant. I, I prefer to be a part-time servant. I, I come on Sundays and occasionally I'll try to make it Wednesday nights. But other than that, my week is kind of full. I don't think I can dedicate myself completely to the Lord because I have other things to do. Some get this mistaken thinking that the Lord desires you to drop everything and to spend 24-7 on your knees praying. If you have the ability to do that, wonderful. But most of us don't. We have jobs and careers and things to do. But what he says is, I want you to be my bondservant in whatever area you are. Meaning that whether, if you're at work or at school or doing whatever it is, serve me. That means our priority and our choices, the things we do, the way we act, will be affected by Jesus Christ. And we'll be shining his light to those around us. Giving your all means that in all your work and family and everything, you put Jesus first. He guides every decision, every plan. We don't say, well, Jesus, I've got you and, and, and you've got some good stuff, but I'll make my own decisions when it comes to my business or my home or, or family or whatever it is. No, we say, Jesus, you're number one. And so when it comes to work, when it comes to home, when it comes to whatever it might be that I'm doing, I'm going to go to you first. And I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. Oftentimes, to be honest, we don't want the Lord to interfere with our plans. We have plans for our life. We have things that we want to do. And we feel like, well, if I completely dedicate my heart to the Lord, if I completely surrender myself to Him, if I pierce my ear and put that gold ring in, then I won't be able to do the things that I want to do. Here's the trick. Our God loves us so much that He will do amazing things in your life. He will work in the things that you're doing. He might kibosh some of your plans. But that's because they would hurt you. And he's got something way better. Something way better. I'm always amazed at the candy store when a kid will have a little tiny 25 cent sucker. And the parent is trying to give them the six dollar big massive sucker. And the kid's having a fit. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. This is my choice. And you go, hey kid, that's the better choice. That's the bigger sucker. But that's kind of what we do sometimes. I got my plans, God, back off. And God's going, I'm God of the universe. I think I know what's best. And I've got an amazing plan for you. If you just put down the sucker and just move on. That's how I sometimes feel at work. Just put it down. <laughs> Parents want you to, oh. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We can't be fooled to think that we can serve something else and God at the same time. The word mammon means wealth, prosperity, financial gain. And in a lot of cases, that's where we find ourselves caught because we seem to run after that career or those plans that we have to make things better. And he says, look, I'm going to take care of you. Jesus goes on in this teaching in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. After he says this, the next lines, he says, hey, don't worry about your food. Don't worry about your clothing. Don't worry what tomorrow brings. Don't worry. I've got you covered. <clears throat> The Lord is going to take care of you. We often can waste today worrying about two weeks from now. We've wasted every opportunity we have right now because we're worrying what's going to happen two weeks from now. And the Lord's saying, don't worry about that. We'll get there when we get there. So often we get confused and we run after these things and spend our whole time freaking out about something that hasn't even happened yet. 
The Lord is a good master and he will take care of your needs and he will fill you with joy and peace. But if we follow after the world, the flesh and the devil, we'll be left hungry and cold and alone. If you've been struggling between two masters, today go to the doorpost and allow the Lord to pierce your ear and place that ring in and say, I am a servant of you, 100% fully sold out to you. I'm devoted to you, wholly and completely. I'm putting my whole life behind me and saying, Lord, I want to serve you in every decision, in everything that I do at work, in everything I do with my family, everything I do with my friends, everything I do, whatever I do, I want you to be first in everything. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. He was called to be an apostle. The word apostle means sent out one. One that's sent out with orders. One that's been given orders and is sent out to take them to the people. Paul was sent out by Jesus to share the good news of Jesus Christ. When he was stopped on that road to Damascus, the Lord said, hey, I got work for you to do. I'm sending you out. And I always love that illustration because when we see Paul's life, it just seems like he's always moving. He's like, Rrr. he just never stops. He's like, you can see back then they'd be like, he's ADHD, you know. He just doesn't stop. He's just like, he's in jail and he's pacing back and forth and they're like, slow down, man. God literally picked him up, his legs are still flailing, he's still going, and he says, okay, Paul, you ready for this? And he turns around and goes, go, I got work for you to do. And Paul was sent out with the gospel. And there are different apostles, or different apostles that are listed in the scripture. In Hebrews chapter 3, it says that Jesus was an apostle sent out, because he came to the world, he came to this earth with a message, the gospel to bring to us. Jesus appointed his special apostles, the 12 apostles. He appointed them to establish and plant the church. The Holy Spirit appointed apostles in the book of Acts as he sent out Barnabas and all these other guys to do the work of the ministry. And he's even sending out apostles today. Anyone who's sent out to do the work of the gospel is an apostle. They've sent out and they're doing the work. But just as important as missionaries and pastors are those who are called to be apostles at home or at work or around our community. We are all called to be apostles in some way or another because we've been given a message and we've been sent out. Jesus didn't say, stay here in this upper room, don't go nowhere. He said, hey, you know what, I want you guys to go out. <clears throat> I want you to share the good news of the gospel with everyone around us. It's important for us to understand this, that we all have a responsibility to share the good news. And we learned about that last week as we were looking at first or 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when we talked about that ministry of reconciliation. That we've been given a ministry to reconcile people back to God. He did the work and now we share the truth with everyone. You can be reconciled. You can be brought back to God. <laughs> But we often, often fall for the devil's lies. Oh, you're just a mom. What can you do? You just work in an office. What can you do? You're not a pastor or a Bible teacher or a missionary. You're just a normal, everyday Joe. What could you do? You know what? We can do a lot. You know, we saw it in the book of Acts how Paul often went to churches that he didn't plant. We don't have any record of who planted them. Because there were people going out and spreading the gospel all over the place. And they didn't have to be an apostle. They didn't have to be a disciple. Or they had to be a disciple of Jesus. But they didn't have to be one of the disciples, right? One of the apostles. They were just people who were sent out with the gospel. They were on fire for God and they went out and shared the word of God. God has called us to share his good news. That Jesus loves us so much that he went and died on the cross for us that we might be saved. And we can share that no matter where we are, no matter who we are. It doesn't have to be in a ministry environment. It can be over a lunch break, over coffee, sharing it with our kids and raising them up in the Word of God. Whatever and wherever you are, you can share the gospel. 
And whatever you're doing and wherever you are, you can do it unto the Lord. We can do it unto the Lord. And that's what it means to be a bondservant. I'm doing this for the Lord. Hey, my job may be a pain, but I'm doing it unto the Lord. My kids may be driving me insane, but I'm doing it unto the Lord. <laughs> my grandkids, don't get me started. I don't have any, so yeah, don't get me started. <laughs> the Lord come quickly. Um, <laughs> We can do all these things unto the Lord. When we allow the Lord to change us and move us, we can do amazing things. Paul says that he was an apostle separated to the gospel of God. We need to be loving those around us, and part of the loving is sharing, them, sharing with them the gospel, teaching them the good news. Will they smirk? Oh yeah. Will they ask stupid questions? Most likely. But we just continue to share the truth and live it out before their eyes. It says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Paul was separated. Set apart into the gospel. Our lives need to be set apart. Do we really understand that we should be living differently than those around us? That our life needs to be set apart? Separated, that our love for the Lord should be changing the way we live and the choices we make. If we look like the guy next door, there's a problem, unless the guy next door is a nice fellow believer. But if we look like the guy next door and we act like the guy next door and we yell at our kids and yell at our wife and do all the things just like the guy next door, what do we have? We need to be changed by the gospel. We need to allow it to change and grow in us. Romans 12, verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. We need to be those who are being transformed. Not being conformed, but transformed. We want to be changed, right? How many of us want to stay the same? No, don't be shy. Any, no, no. I think pretty well all of us kind of go, no, 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 I would like to change, please. I'd like to change, thank you. That's why at the beginning of the new year, what do we do? We make resolutions. I'm going to start working out. I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to be this or I'm going to do that. I'm going to be better at this, I'm going to do that. You know what they say about resolutions? They last about 21 days. Because we're doing it on our own steam. We don't get very far. But you know what? When we make a choice to change, when we allow the Spirit to change us, He changes us. He transforms us by the renewing of our minds. He changes our mind. I don't know about you, but I, I like the idea of that. My mind can be a mess sometimes. And I would like it to be changed, please. Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We begin to think differently. We begin to see things in life differently than the world. Our lives will begin to prove to others the good and acceptable, perfect will of God. As we are changed, other people are going to see that. They're going to say, hey, there's something different about them. Have you noticed how they've changed? Have you noticed that they're different? Not that they're weird. And I've said this before. Not that you're walking around all weird. But that there's something different about us. Because we're living rightly. We're walking righteously. We're right living in right living. We should be those who are separated in our living. And we should be living right, separated to the gospel, to the truth of our salvation. We should act like we are those that are saved. When we're walking around, moping around, yeah, I know God gives you peace, and I know He will take care of me, but oh. We need our minds to be renewed. And here's the trick. We can talk about it, we can share about it, we can do all these things, but what do we have to do? We got to do something. We have to make the choice to allow the Holy Spirit, because He's a gentleman. He is like that butler I talked about earlier. He stands there with the thing over his sleeve, you know, or like a waiter, 
He just stands there going, yes, just waiting. What would you like? Nothing? Okay, I'll just stand here. He just stands there and he waits for us to say, okay, Lord, I'm ready. Lord, work. Change me. Change my heart. Change my mind. Work in me. I want to see a difference. And when we allow him to work, we begin to be set apart and separated to the gospel of the truth of God. He begins his work of sanctification in our life, changing us and making us into a new creation. Wow. We've only just begun this book. How far did we get this week? You weren't joking about four years. Four years. <laughs> we got chapter one. Verse 1, and I challenge you as you begin 2018, jump in and read the rest of the book. We're going to go through it. I promise you I'll go a little faster. But I just felt it important as we begin this book that we talk about the importance of who Paul was and how he dedicated his life to the Lord and how we need to be the same way. Because this book is going to challenge us to change the way we think, to change the way we walk, and to follow after God. You know, the cool thing about this book is that in the book of Romans, the word God is used 153 times, more than any other book. Because this book is about getting to know God better. And you might think, well, I know, I know God pretty good. Well, you know what? You can never know Him pretty good. You always have, can know Him better. You can always draw closer to Him. You can always run closer and run faster. I encourage you, as we jump into this, that this book is going to transform you. And I'll warn you, that's not going to be easy. Sometimes it hurts. How many of you guys, and you don't have to be, well, be honest, did some working out this week, because it's the beginning of the year. All right, we got some people here. Are you sore? No, see, now they're not going to be honest. When we begin to change, when we begin to move, when we begin to exercise our faith, there's some creaking and some popping and some you know, stretched muscles. But what did they used to say to us in the old days? No pain, no gain. <laughs> but it's true, right? In order for our muscles to get stronger, they need to be stretched. Is the proper term torn? Is it torn? Torn. They're being torn, right? Yeah. Uh, Blood vessels. No. They're, they're being stretched. Stretched is better. I was in, I, I'm looking at the nurses in the room going, am I saying it right? Because I don't want them going after me. You don't tear a muscle. That's bad. Uh, but we stretch the muscles out, and that gets them going. But that hurts, and it causes a little bit of pain and discomfort. But as we continue to do it, what happens? We become stronger, and it doesn't hurt anymore. And if you're crazy, you just keep pushing it further and further. Next thing you know, you're lifting 500 pounds. <laughs> but as we begin to do things, I'll tell you the truth, it hurts. It hurts to grow. How many of you guys remember growing pains? Why is my knee hurting? Why is my elbow hurting? I'm only 15. This is insane. We go through these growing pains and we begin to ache. Yeah, I'm still having them because I'm young, right? <laughs> but as we work and as we grow, we get stronger and we're built up. And last week we talked about the ministry of reconciliation. God has reconciled himself back with him through Jesus Christ. He's reconciled us back to God. He has brought us back into relationship with him. And I challenge you, and I challenged you last week to write down some names. Where's my Bible? Now, how many of you guys, here's the homework. How many of you guys remember your cards? Now, if you weren't here, I'm going to let you out the hook a little bit. There are more cards in the back. How many of you guys wrote down names on your card? Good. Wow, you guys. You're all staying after school. <laughs> Our challenge was is to, as we start 2018, to be intentionable, was the word I made up last week, is to write down some people that we know in our community, our neighbors, friends. I wrote down neighbors across the way because I don't know their names. I know a few of their names, but I don't know all their names. But I've had chances to chat with them and talk, and I want to open up more conversation with them. 
I wrote down a person, a Sue at the store, because I know her name because she has a name tag, but I talk to her quite often. And so I'm like, I want to have an opportunity to share with her. Um, so if you don't know their name, which often happens, people you bump into regularly, just write down a guy at the pharmacy or whatever. But I encourage you to write it down and we're going to begin to pray. We're going to begin to pray for them. I don't have a table for this one. We're going to begin to pray for them intentionally saying, okay, every day I'm going to take my card to remind me. That's all these are for, is to remind us. Take my card to remind me to pray for these people that the Lord will work and draw them and convict their hearts. And then I'm going to continue to pray as we continue on that I'll get opportunities to share with them. And then I'm going to continue to pray that I will get an opportunity to invite them out to church. Invite them out to hear and, and to be part of what we have here. That they would hear the gospel and give their life to Jesus. And we're going to pray about it and we're going to do it. It's an exercise to get going. You know that they say if you want to keep your resolution, you must make it a habit. It's got to become part of your regular routine. And when you do that, when you can do that, then you're going to continue doing it. If you don't do that, the dumbbells and the weights are going to sit in the corner and collect dust. And people will come over and say, what are those for? I'm like, oh, the decorations. <laughs> Keep them there. I use them once in a while. They look like they haven't used in 20 years. Oh, <laughs> Honey, we should dust those. Put handprints on them or something. I don't know. But we need to take these and write the names down. And if you weren't here, or if you're sitting there like some of us might be going, uh, I can't think of anybody, then you know what we're going to do? We're going to spend some time right now and we're going to pray about that. Lord, put someone on my heart. And I'll, I'll tell you the truth. When we do that, when we walk around our life, all of a sudden light bulb comes out and we go, ah, there's that person I keep running into, that person I keep talking to. And you know what? I need to pray for them. Before it was just that person, you say hi all the time, you chat for five seconds and you keep moving. But now we need to be praying for them. Intentionally. Is that the word we the last week? We need to be intentional. About it. One candle is small. It gives off a little bit of light. If I shut off all the lights in this room and had one candle going, it would still be dark in here. But that one candle, that one spark, can ignite this hotel on fire and burn it to the ground and start a forest fire that can destroy the entire area. Pretty scary. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. But as we individually and corporately come together and pray for these names and these people that we're praying for, imagine the fire that can be started in our hearts as we are woken up, as we begin to see people differently and, and, and intentionally look for opportunities, but also the fire that can be started in our community and people's lives. Because that's how every great revival started, with some people simply pray. People simply pray. When Calvary Chapel first started, Pastor Chuck looked at the hippies and went, dirty hippies, go get a job. But the Lord put it on his wife, wife's heart, okay, we should pray for them. And he went, okay, yeah, I guess we should. And they went down to the beach and they would look at the hippies hanging out and they would pray for them. Then his wife said, you know what, I want to meet one. I want to meet one of these hippies. And he was just like, oh, okay. So their daughter was dating a former hippie, and they said to him, hey, you were a former hippie, can you find some hippies that we can meet? And so he brought some hippies home for them to meet. <laughs> and you know what, that was the beginning of a great revival. As they just began to pray, and they looked for opportunities to share. And even when they, Chuck admits it, was looking at them going, good luck with that one. But the Lord changed his heart as he prayed, and he was the one who years later, when they had built their building, and one of the elders put a sign on the door that said, no shoes, no service. He's the one who tore it down and said, hey, if that's what we're going to do, let's tear the carpet up. I'm not going to turn people away. I don't care who they are. They need to hear the gospel. It began to work and change, and change lives. And I realize this is a stretching exercise for us. It could be a little bit of pain. A little bit of hurt, but it's something we need to do together. 
to build each other up. So the other thing we're going to do is as we write down these names, I want you to share the names with other people in the fellowship and say, can you help me pray for this person on a weekly basis? Help me pray for them. And then we'll have all have a list of people to pray for and we can be praying for them. You're at work, you can maybe even put that in your pocket and work you can Pray for the guy who stands on the corner by the, by the grocery store. I pray for this person, I pray for that. Whatever it might be. Pray for the neighbor in the yellow house. Um, you know, we just continue to pray. The Lord knows who we're praying for. So don't worry, he's got it under control. So right now as we draw our service to close, what we're going to do is we're going to split up into groups. Yeah, I know, isn't that horrible? We're going to split up in groups. <laughs> of four or five or so. And we are going to pray for those that we know in the community. And maybe we need to pray for the Lord to put someone on our heart. And we're going to pray together that the Lord would challenge us to begin to be intentional about this. Or intentional, as I like to say. As we continue to seek the Lord. So let's divide up into prayer.